Okay. Ah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. If, if you're just joining us, welcome to our interview series. Uh, if you were here for our concert earlier this evening, welcome back. Today we have our very special guest um, and longtime friend of mine, multi-instrumentalist Jay Thomas. He's a wonderful uh, trumpeter, uh, flautist, flugelhorn player, saxophone player. I've heard him play wonderful uh, clarinet. And due to COVID-19, I've seen some videos of him playing some pretty good piano as well, or Rhodes, uh-huh. I think, at his... At his uh, home. So um, anyways, welcome. Glad you're here. And uh, I'm going to talk to Jay. If, if you're new to the series, I, I interview our guests for about 45 minutes and then I open things up for uh, um, questions. So if you have any questions for Jay, uh, feel free to uh, um, let us know what you'd like to ask and we'll see if we can get to them. And even if we can't get to them live, uh, they'll be on the feed later after we post this so uh, we can get to those later as well. So Jay, hello. Welcome. Thanks hey. for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Our yeah. pleasure. Thanks for playing. Uh, as usual, uh, yeah. always, always inspiring, and and things to hear and yeah. try try to absorb. And there's there's so much. Um, so for those of you who don't know you, um, and I don't really know all this stuff, how did you get started playing? Well, you know, uh, I got started with with the trumpet, and I enjoyed the trumpet a lot, and. Somewhere along the line, you know, I think that there were, you know, little jazz bands in, through the school starting starting up and things like that. And uh, I, uh, you know, it wasn't a, a big, big deal, but I, I kind of liked it. And uh, uh, there was one point where I, I heard something that I really liked and I, I was kind of being uh, steering myself into music uh, I enjoyed band a lot and so it was, it was kind of through the school and it was about well you know how you start an instrument uh, I, I started taking private lessons and I think I started with the half an hour lessons and then I went to hour lessons and you know, I was going through uh, books and things like that, and somewhere along the way, I could kind of play okay. And it was like somewhere in the junior junior high years, I could I could play my trumpet okay. And and uh, it was about ninth grade that I really wanted to play uh, jazz. And I, I have to mention that that there was a lot of jazz around in my house. My dad was playing gigs and things like that. It, he wasn't really going out and playing jazz gigs so much, but he was playing with jazz players on gigs, swing swing music. And we had there was I just always remember charts laying around and and things like that. And he would be practicing and. Uh, he had quite a few friends. He has no, he had no brothers or sisters, so his friends were like kind of like my my uncles and uh, and so uh, I I got it also through a personal thing through my family. We weren't like a super musical family, but my sister plays plays still plays good flute, and my dad still plays. He's ninety. Uh, ninety-one. Yeah. Mar- Marvin Thomas. Yeah, yeah. He looks great. I would never guess he's ninety-one. Yeah, yeah. He's he's doing fine, and and uh, uh, he plays, and so uh, it's it's a lot of fun. I I remember uh, starting out, and one of the things that I wanted to do was be able to improvise and play a solo. And uh, my first experiments were. Not so great, you know. I mean, you know, I was just like, uh, we play like a stock or something uh, in junior high, and I would and I would think of something to play, you know, and and sometimes they're like, God, there'd be breaks and all kinds of stuff, you know, like things for a novice. It's horrible. Ding, 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 ding. Boom, break, and you just go, you know, and you fall apart. Uh, but. Uh, uh, I got some help, you know, so, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it was also cool because the high school I was going into, they had a pretty good band. 
You grew up in Seattle, correct? Yeah, I grew up, and it was out north end of Seattle. And Shoreline had a pretty good band. In fact, the guy ended up in Tacoma, you probably know him, Noel Abramson. Well, he was, like, big in music education and, and uh, in the, around here. I think his son plays a good lead trumpet player. Is a good lead trumpet player, and he ended up at PLU or someplace, and uh, he had a lot of charts, and the high school band, they were all seniors, and they were good. So I really wanted to get in that, that band, and... Um, I, uh, you know, took some lessons and, you know, learned, uh, was working on scales and learned to keep my place in the blues and whatever, you know, and stuff. Who was, um, you said you took some lessons, so who were some of the teachers that you studied with when you were getting things together in Seattle? Well, my dad was friends with Floyd Staniford, so that was like, you know, that's like royalty. Uh, Floyd was great, and, and he... Uh, and also Jabba Ward was another guy, and they uh, showed me, yeah, yeah, Thomas, check out the, the keys are changing here, you know, and I learned some basic tunes, Misty and whatever, you know, just took them apart, and I went, wow, yeah, yeah, I see, you know, how, how that works a little bit, and uh, uh, then I got a little uh, swing band. My dad helped put together this swing band with Milt Klebe charts. It was basically a tenor band. But he had a lot of hip charts, and they were all always fun to play, real fun to play, because Milt was a great uh, writer, a line writer, where every part was fun. It wasn't like the, the Pete Barbuti fourth trumpet, you know, joke, you know, where you play all, all just notes to make the chords. But Every part was good, and so we had Milt, Milt's library, and we started work, working uh, some, and so I started to figure out how how it felt and stuff. But I still, it was still a, a mystery, especially Milt's charts. The, he had way too many changes. He he would put in the changes all the arranger stuff. It would be like a change every beat practically, you know. I just go. Oh. You know, and uh, so uh, it was that. And then there were, uh, when I got in high school, there were a lot of, uh, like, dance bands that had had uh, uh, sax and trumpet. There would be a uh, horn section, like trumpet and, and tenor, usually. So when you were growing up, I mean, you had Floyd and, and Job Award. Who else uh, around the Seattle scene were people that you admired and respected and kind of followed around and tried to learn from? Well, uh, there was a guy named Jordan Rui, and he's now out in Kent, but at the time he was very, very uh, dedicated uh, practicer and this and that, and he'd been through the Navy uh, music school, and he had a lot of bebop and things, and, and he was, always, you know, so uh, he helped me quite a bit, uh, and and I would listen to him play. I started going down to this place called the, the Queequeg, and then I went to another place called the Languilon, and it was run by the same guy, this guy named Jerry Heldman, and Jerry was a bass player, and all kinds of people would go down there that would come through town. I remember being in high school the first time I went down there to sit in and I it was uh, Joe Brazil hosted the jam now Joe Brazil came from Detroit and he was friends with train and all these people and he was he had a really cool uh, situation he was a real community kind of guy he had sessions at his house in fact you could find the Joe Brazil basement sessions, they're unbelievable. One of them is, is Train and, and uh, Joe Henderson and, and some alto player, Hank La uh, Hugh Lawson. And Didn't someone, I, was it Steve Griggs or someone that did a Joe Brazil project, but was that part right. of that or was that something different? Well, uh, Steve, they, they got those tapes. And then this one's up on YouTube now. It's called uh, the Joe Brazil basement sessions. And the, the Fidelity... Is awful, but the playing is incredible. 
it, 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 don't be confused that like, oh yeah, things are just getting better and better. No, no. There was there were guys in there like Joe and 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 Train were hitting, and then there was an alto player better than they were. And I just went, oh my God! And the rhythm section was killing. And uh, it's right on on YouTube. And they play Paul's pal. I'm just silly little tune, and I'm going. That's beyond me to figure out how to play it. And these guys are just killing it. Just uh, so creative. So that was really. Uh, uh, fun. I, I got off on a side trip, but Joe Brazil was the first guy that I, I went down to to that public session. Went down there and, and uh, I had a tune all ready to go. Straight no chaser. I, I even remember, you know, I, I was probably not that small, but it seemed like in, in my memory, I was like looking up, you know. I probably wasn't, but yeah, that's the way the memory is. And uh, uh, he was nice to me because sometimes that's the way where it's at. I mean, uh, as far as my uh, uh, take on it is, is you know, sometimes it's for for me anyway. It's not like always like you know spectacular or anything like that. It's just like in in even today. Uh, it's so, but. You know, it's it's fun, and uh, when you're you're playing with people, and they go, "Oh, okay, yeah," they they kind of go, oh, "Okay, uh, that's that's fine," you know, and uh, you know, and so that's the way it was. He wasn't jumping up and down or anything like that. I was a prodigy or anything like that. But I started moving pretty quickly with Floyd and stuff, and uh, in a certain bag that I could I could maneuver in, and. Uh, so uh, that was high school, and uh, what what time period was this for you? When, when was high school? Just for people that don't know your your background. Well, you know, I'm. Uh, this was like in the mid '60s. So I graduated from high school in '67, and uh, I had I went to Berkeley in the summer of '66. That was fun, and I learned a lot there. And who was who was on the faculty um, at the time? I had Tracy Canope here earlier, and I, he was there later. So I'm just curious: when you were attending Berkeley, who were some of the the faculty well, members that you really uh, Lee got Santisi stuff from? Lee was there, and uh, uh, Herb Pomeroy, and and just a, a whole host of, of great uh, people. And and the, was mainly the players, the other students that were like, wow, and. Uh, I had fun and and got in Herb Pomeroy's band and uh, there and and was uh, even doing some some gigs. I was one of the downbeat scholarship people for the summer, and they had people from all over. Uh, there was a real good arranger from uh, L.A. and uh, I met a drummer. I became pretty tight with this drummer uh, from the Bay Area, and. So that was fun. I made some connections. I went down and stayed with the, at the guys, the drummer's place after I graduated from high school, went down to San Francisco. And that was, that was fun. So how long, how long did you live in San Francisco? Well, I didn't live there at that time, but I went down there, at, you know, it was like the, the summertime. I, I was heading off to Boston. Uh, I was going to Boston to go to school, but, uh, you know, uh, it's a different time now, but at that time, I had already been, you know, playing with, uh, with people and doing, uh, gigs. I played with this band around Seattle. We did, we backed up all the Motown bands when they came through, and they were all original people and stuff. We played behind the Temptations and the Four Tops and the Martha and the Vandalas and just everybody. Major Lance, his daughter is the mayor of Atlanta. Major Lance did a had a hit called Monkey Time. And so when I went to Berkeley, it was not grabbing me. 
and and I had so many other distractions and things, and I just went, you know, it, it's not something that I would necessarily uh, recommend, re- recommend, but I went, you know, I, I kind of know what I want to do, and so I got out of there right away. I just went, no, I don't want to go there, and it was like, uh, it was like, and and I ended up coming back. I was in in Boston for a few months. I came back around Christmas, and I moved out in Rainier Valley. And I ended up living on this hill. Uh, Jordan Rui, sax player, was next door to me, and then down another one is this guy named Steve Hawes. Steve Hawes was a great drummer. We used to have these jam jam sessions and stuff. Uh, Steve was from New York and got, like a lot of people from around here, he got out of the service and stuck around here for a while. And he was working at the Checkmate. The Checkmate was up on 23rd Madison, uh, Sonny Booker and Sonny Buxton. Sonny Buxton had a, uh, a jazz club in San Francisco later on called Pearls. But the Checkmate... Uh, when we were living on that hill, uh, Steve was going and working at the Checkmate all the time with Woody Woodhouse and, and Mike Mandel. Mike Mandel's a great organ player. I also got lessons from him. Mike Mandel was blind, and that was a great uh, lesson because he didn't give me any written stuff. I remember the first lesson. In fact, I came in, he goes, yeah, he's like rocking because he was a blind guy. Like, you're rocking. He goes, yeah. And he goes, you know, on that old, you know, thing. And he goes, Donald Bird, page one, you know. And and I went, okay, you know, Mike, slow it down. And so that's how I learned from him. And he showed me a lot of things. And so we had these sessions and things, and then Steve... Uh, I I didn't really have a lot of, of uh, you know, there was no plans or five-year plans or whatever. I was playing and, you know, busy and getting by. And, but Steve was ambitious, and he was going back to New York. And he goes, uh, I'm going to New York. Would you like to come? And I thought about it for about, you know, 30 seconds and went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, so the next thing, you know, save some, some money and whatever. I, I got a, uh, a gig. I was working as a storekeeper at Bo- at Boeing's, and we we took off after a few months. We, we drove to New York, and uh, that was something. We come into New York, and, God, we could pull in there. It's late. We're trying to find this his friend, the tenor player, at this apartment. We're trying to find Terry Pippo's apartment in the East Village. And here's a guy walking with a horn down the sidewalk. Oh, excuse me, do you know where Terry Pippo's? Oh, yeah, he lives right here. And uh, I said, what's your name? You know, he looked like he'd been on a gig. And he goes, Renee McLean. And I go, wow, uh, Jackie McLean? Yeah, that's my dad. You know, whoa, you know, just like the whole situation was 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 great i mean at that time you could look in the phone book and there's wow miles davis's number here's Thelonious monk's number you know should i call him you know why you know but uh it was just uh, amazing and it wasn't as expensive but it was very dangerous also the city was different then uh vietnam was going like crazy this was around uh when was this? Well, this I guess this would be uh, 68, uh, end of 68. So I was there and, and found uh, Steve got hooked into this, uh, these jams. There was a place they had jam sessions all the time. It was really cool. Uh, Muse Art, was, it was called. It was right around the corner from where we lived. We got a when we got to New York, we ended up finding a place. It was a storefront. It had been a store. And it was in, in down on Thompson Street, right in Greenwich Village. And it was a store, and we had to, they, they you know, plumbed it in and, and did some things, little modifications. And we built, we built a sleeping loft so we could fit in there. 
And uh, right around the corner, uh, up the street, there was Village Gate. Uh, around the corner was this, this session place called Musart. And this guy named George Braith ran that joint. And it was really cool. It was another situation kind of like with the Joe Brazil thing, only I was, by this time, I, you know, I was, uh, I didn't understand, you know, like the New York thing exactly. And I remember the first session I went there and George says to me, what do you want to play? I said, forest flower. And he goes, he shakes his head, oh, no, you know, the standard. So uh, I remember uh, I, I liked playing uh, uh, I'm Getting Sentimental Over You because I, I learned it from Monk, Monk Record. Uh, Joe Gordon played trumpet on it. It sounded great, and I peeled Joe's sol solo off, and I could play it okay. So I played that, and, and he, you know, it was like one of those situations where you just pass a certain level where you're okay. He wasn't going, ooh, you know. He just went, hmm, okay, <laughs> you know, that's fine. So I kept going back there and uh, got some lessons in, in, in town and uh, various things. Uh, uh, I would pay, uh, there was this place called Lynn Oliver Studios, you could pay to play. And they had like rehearsal bands. And some of the top people in, in the number one rehearsal band, they were going out on the road with different people and stuff. And it was midtown Manhattan. And so I was going to the Lynn Oliver Studios and my chops were horrible. And uh I mean, I could play good, but my endurance was just sucked and whatever. And uh, I was, and so I played this one little gig. It was a strange gig, like a Ukrainian dance or something. They had these guys doing these dances, uh, Russian dances. And the other trumpet player, because I could play some jazz he uh, took pity on me and 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 he said oh you need to go to uh, carmine caruso so he sent me to a guy and and through that contact uh, it started to get my chops got better and and uh i started playing with some latin bands and i i, I had moved the, the, there was two couples in this uh, uh apartment in east village I mean, in the West Village, it was down uh, uh, the Italian section. And we moved uptown, and it was basically in Spanish Harlem. So there was Latin bands all over, and I'm playing, practicing my Carmen stuff, and the next thing I get kind of drafted in the neighborhood band. Well, neighborhood band was really good. We played the YMCA up on the, uh, uptown in Harlem. And you know, some dances and things. And then I got uh, through another rehearsal band I started doing. Uh, I got a, uh, uh, a call to play with Machito's band in the summer. It was a whole summer long gig up in the Catskills. And I was, I had no idea who Machito was really. I mean, he's a big time Latin band, but but I was like kind of second string kind of thing because the real heavyweights that he had, a lot of them stayed in the city. They weren't going to go up there to the bungalow and stay up there in the Catskills. But it was a fun gig. I learned a lot there. Uh, so that was uh, what? A summer, that was Woodstock happened then. I was just like playing with Machito's band right right by the Woodstock. Saw all these hippies going by in cars. I'm like, where, where are you going? In rock festival. You know, ended up going with the guy, some of the guys on Machito's band to Woodstock. I said, come on, guys, let's go. <laughs> these guys were going, what is this? You know, I mean, they were like really, you know, urban kind of thing. And all of a sudden they're going, what? What is this? You know, the hippies and you know, the, the who and all that. And so 
that was really uh, a learning experience that whole uh, time. I, I, I was learning, and uh, I had transcribed, I still got into transcribing somewhere along the line. And I was learning, you know, uh, songs and solos and things like that. So I, I started to play a, a little better. And, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was enjoying the Colligan, uh, thing. He was saying, yeah, he's going to get the Bolivia, you know, the hardest tune. Well, I, I transcribed train solo on, on giant steps. I mean, I had it, I had a little turntable. I could turn it down. My turntable would go half speed. It sounded like, you know, like a baritone, you know, bah, 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 you know, and, I just went on basically a note at a time, but I had that solo down, and then I started to get into that kind of playing more. And a couple of times when my chops work were working with the the Carmine stuff, I I play and people kind of go, "Wow, what's going on over there? It sounds pretty good." And um, so after the Machito thing, uh, I was kind of uh, you know, foot loose. I, I didn't have any direction, and I was staying down in the village uh, with this uh, lady who was, she wasn't really a girlfriend. She was kind of weird, too, but, uh, you know, she says, she, uh, she says, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'm not having you hang around here. Uh, she, she looked in the village voice and she's the one that found this this thing. She goes, add in there, you know, needed a trumpet player. She goes, yeah, go to this place. And so I went off to, you know, made a phone call, and they said, yeah, come on by. And so I went to this place called the Albert Hotel, which was a real uh, transient hotel. Like uh, when you walk in, there's like pictures of muddy waters and this and that, all the people there. And it was, But it was also a hotel like, like the Chelsea. You could stay there for fairly cheap. So I go in to this uh, this uh, room, and I'm going, where's the band? You know, where's this audition? And there's a couple of these guys, you know, hippie-looking characters, and they go, oh, yeah. And they look at me, and they're just, they said, play something. So, okay. So I took my trumpet out and played Freedom Jazz Dance, you know, played it, you know, perfect. And they went, okay, uh, we're leaving tomorrow. Can you make this gig? We're going to Lake George tomorrow. I went, oh, yeah. I And, and I said, can I stay here? Because <laughs> I needed a place to stay. So I, I ended up having the kitchen. I had a cot in the kitchen. They just went, oh, yeah, come on in. So they put a cot in the kitchen, and that was my abode for a while when we weren't playing up in Lake George. Lake George was a steady gig up there. It was like Lake George is uh, uh, kind of, I'm not sure how far it is, a couple hours uh, up north uh, in uh, upstate New York. And so... I started playing with this this band. It turned out that the guy, I got in with some pretty good people. One of the guys wrote the music for Grease, and another guy ended up being the drummer for Bob Dylan. It's a Rolling Thunder review and stuff. So it was really pretty happening, and they were writing this music and doing all kinds of stuff. So I, I stayed there for a while. But there were all kinds of things uh, going on, and I and I kind of got uh, derailed around this this time. Uh, you know, I just uh, was not making the right sorts of of connections, and uh, I was uh, kind of missing some of my friends and and things like that here on the coast, and and some things were going wrong too because of uh just a lot of things the vietnam war was raging and and i missed a, such a uh, like a, a bubblehead that i missed my my first 
appointment for, you know, the draft. And my number came up. Boom. They said, come on down for your physical. Bring your toothbrush and you're ready to go. So I was staying up in Spanish Harlem and one of the guys in my building, he was like using dope and stuff. And I said, oh, okay, Johnny, can you get me some of that? And so I started doing some of the dope. I thought I would pretend like I was a dope fiend and go down there and get out. And uh, well, I got out all right. <laughs> but, but I kind of picked that, that up uh, and it kind of ran, ran uh, pretty rough shot over my life for, well, it's like somebody the other day said, how long? And I said, 19 years. And they said, <laughs> they laughed. They said, wow, that's a long time. Yeah, it is a long time. So uh, it kind of uh, curtailed a lot of uh, Things that maybe woulda, shoulda, coulda, and but I kept kept going, and that's all I had was was the music. Uh, I ended up uh, coming back to Seattle, and then I went back to New York, and then I uh, I was in Seattle, and uh, things were going kind of south, and I ended up going down to Olympia, Washington because I'd been in this rehearsing with this band and whatever, and we were rehearsing all the time. We had some things going, but things were not going well for me. And this guy came by, this this guy named Andy Duvall, and he comes by my place, and he's got his red hearse that he drove. For, that was his car. And he comes by and he goes, Yeah, Jay, got this gig down in Olympia. You know, well, come on, let's go. And I said, Oh, and he could see my whole scene, you know, like he looks around, he's kind of sucking his teeth. And, and I said, oh, can we go tomorrow? I had something, you know, some drug-related thing. And he goes, no, no, you have to go now. And I went, okay. <laughs> and so the next thing I'm in Olympia and, and, and playing and having having a, a good time. And then I was having like part of a, uh, I think we need friends and some kind of community because uh, before that I was kind of uh, I had a few friends but uh, it wasn't giving me what I needed and so, like a support system like a support system so I ended up down there for a while and um, and uh, I met the mother of, of my my uh, son uh, and we we were going along and, and doing stuff and I was playing these weekend gigs and then I got a call to play up in uh, Seattle with a guy named Dave Lewis. Dave Lewis was, is Devon, Devon's grandfather. What was his name? Is Devon's grandfather. That's Gene Argel. He's in Hawaii. So he's he was around that time too. Gene. So for for the listeners that don't know, um, Dave Lewis was a very well known organ player in the Seattle scene. Right, right. He was kind of he could have been a big star, and it kind of he had it going in, way back in the late fifties, and you know the he but he could play jazz also as well as R and B. I mean he knew enough. Like uh, I was playing with Dave Lewis one time, and and Gerald Brashear came in, and they they played. And, you know, Gerald, you know, sit, sat in and they played uh, Jordu. I mean, well, okay, that's something. Oh, Dave Lewis, oh, yeah, fine, I can play that. So it was, it, it was uh, that was a, a cool gig. So I started playing with Dave for a while. We had a house band gig. And in these, day, these days, that was the whole goal, is to get on a band where you'd get enough work. And Dave Lewis's band was kind of one of those bands that got enough work. He would get a steady gig for a while. We played at this place called the Heritage House on Martin Luther King. And then we ended up playing this place called the Fresh Air Tavern. And we were off. They'd have national bands like uh, come in, Aerto and, and people like that. And we'd play alternate with with us they would play a couple sets we play a couple sets and uh that was going 
okay for a while, and then things got a little weird. I got a couple of, you know, dance gigs also with, with steady, like, top 40-style bands. And then I decided uh, to leave town, and I, I was heading towards Los Angeles, and we ran out of gas and all resources in, in Vallejo, California. And Vallejo is, is not a pleasant place. Vallejo is, uh, I apologize to any Vallejo people, but what it was kind of a Navy town, and it was like uh, not, not for me a good situation. And I managed to talk my way into being an, a manager of some apartments, funky apartments, and, 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 you know, get free rent and whatever, and all. Oh, I remember, the, you know, the guy coming and going, yeah, there's these water heaters down here. And I go down under this thing, and there's like a dirt basement with all these rusted water heaters. And he goes, yeah, but you can put these into this, uh, the, you know, the units. And I'm going, oh, boy. <laughs> and uh, it was it was tough. And then I even got a job at a at a convenience store. I got rescued from that because I had met a guy up here. I used to do these jam sessions with this guy named Chuck Shear. And Chuck Shear was, uh, uh, he ended up being like the new real book mogul kind of guy. He's And uh, he had a house in uh, uh, Marin County that he was managing. And when I called him, he says, yeah, we got a room opening up. So... You know, wow! It was like pack up now. We're we're leaving this goodbye job and everything else. We're out of there, and we ended up in uh, Marin County. I had a lot of funny experiences at that time. Almost joined the Marine Corps in in Vallejo. You don't strike me as a military type, Jay. Well, I was so susceptible because I'd go down to the Marine. Uh, place where whatever the the center is where, where the induction center or whatever and they're like talking to me and everything and next thing i'm just like walking like ramrod straight going yes we stopped them on the 33rd parallel and this and that and the other thing and in getting my trumpet and i was going to you know play marches and whatever but what the attraction was was you know money steady you know it said 126 thousand dollars to start, oh man, this is great, you know, and uh, well, it was not a match that was meant to happen. I remember when I drove to the, the to go down to the audition, Treasure Island or something in in uh, Oakland, California. They uh, uh, the guy came and and he looks at me. He goes, "Yeah, you musician?" And I said, uh, "Yeah," and <laughs> he goes, he goes, he goes, "Yeah." The best musician ever was a Marine. And I went, really? And he, and he, go, he goes, yeah, John Philip Sousa. And I went, oh, boy. <laughs> and uh, so that was the deal. I went down there and, 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 and through whatever, I didn't, didn't get in there. But I ended up in Marin County with Chuck, and that kept me going because I didn't, like, you know, bail out from music. Chuck was a very orient, work-oriented guy. Every day I'd hear him practicing and whatever, and I got in with some pretty good players down there also, and and that was pretty good. So I was there for a while, and, and then I came back to Seattle in, the, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 78, 77 or 78 or something, somewhere around in there. It's a little hazy, but I got back and I, I you know, started, I was living in Seattle and Olympia and uh, I started to get in with Bill Ramsey at that time. Bill was somebody that went way back because my dad, uh, I remember going to a Bill Ramsey rehearsal uh, one time when I was uh, just, you know, 15 or something, my dad, 
had his amateur, you know, uh, recording guy. My dad had all this tape recorder and stuff, and he brought the tape recorder down to the Bill Ramsey rehearsal. And Neil Friel was there and all these people. He was just in town off of Woody Herman's band or something, you know, just like, God, it was a great sounding band. Just unbelievable. Bob Wynn was an alto player and 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 Rams he, Rams used to play tenor back then and he had a big broad tenor sound. It was really great. And uh so, you know, when I got back to Seattle and I, I started getting in with uh, Ramsey because I just kind of put it in my mind that I wanted to do that. At this time, my dad, uh, he was getting more and more less into being a pharmacist and more into his real estate and things like that. And, and uh He'd had this jazz thing going, and all of a sudden he wanted to get a club. So somewhere, you know, for a while I'd been working with Bill Sheehan and, and you know, for, God, I don't know. And then my dad gets this club, and that was a, a really a fun period because we had the club for, I don't know, two or three years, maybe three years. And, uh, you know... All kinds of people came through the club, and and I'd hear them rehearse, and I'd be down there bartending and whatever. I'd hear them rehearse, and and got to hear them every night, and and so it was really a, a great situation at that that time. Uh, I learned a lot just being the bug on the wall, watching how they would rehearse and, and comport themselves night night after night. And uh, so that really, really helped. We we got out of that, uh, uh, and a group of people bought the club, and it became Ernestine's. It was called Ernestine's then. It didn't last very long. Ernestine didn't really have any money in it, but it was her name. You're talking about, for for those who don't know, Ernestine Anderson, the yeah, vocalist. Yeah, Ernestine Anderson. She used to work down at the club all the time on New Year's Eve and different times. Ernestine had been had a real great career early on, and then it kind of disappeared. I don't know what was going on, but she kind of came back when Red Kelly had, had a, a place down there in Tumwater. And... Uh, she started singing again, Ernestine. In the next thing, she was hooked up with Ray Brown. Well, that was great. I mean, the Ernestine with Ray Brown, that is a killing uh, thing. She goes, I'm walking and all these things. It's just killing. Uh, uh, so swinging and right in, in her, uh, you know, right in, in her wheelhouse. I mean, she could really go to town. But Ernestine could be kind of difficult, and the next thing, she was on the outs with uh, Ray. And uh, it's it's kind of, you know, it's too bad in a way. I know she had the hit, you know, could have made your move too soon and whatever, but I think that she could have been filling the shoes of, of the divas that were that were dying, and that would have been what I would like, to, you know, because she could do standards like nobody's business. It just she was great. This this area really, she is one of the greats. I got to know Buddy Catlett really well around this time too, because he had come back to Seattle, and he was playing with Bill Sheehan on those gigs. Well, that's when I first one of the bands when I was sixteen, seventeen, started working with was. Uh, Tuxedo Junction with you and Buddy was playing bass and right, uh, right. Joe Bach and right, Chuck Stance right. and Rams and well, all those I guys. remember you from, uh, yeah, you were like on the case and uh, what was the great thing about uh, you is like you had a idea of what you wanted to do, which is really good, and you weren't uh, waiting like in line taking a ticket you you were like getting gigs and hiring uh uh 
I, I got hired by you. That's how I met you. That's a, that's what the way it's done. I I got, you know how I got in with Ramsey, hired him. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I hired him. And next thing, because I was going, yeah, I was, you know, the, the different people he had, like on uh, the trumpet chair, I was going, yeah, I'm, I'm mumbling, blah, 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 you know, I, I bet, you know, and so I get Ramsey on a gig, and all of a sudden, wow, this is working. You know, he brought some. Uh, some little charts in uh, some uh, uh, small group things by uh, 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 Thad Jones and some some things. So it, right away he could see, okay, I could read and blah blah blah. And then I played some tenor. And he goes, oh yeah, that sounds good too. And so next thing he had a uh, a thing called Tenor Dynasty, and that was really fun. Chuck Stentz, and me, and Rams. And Denny Goodhue, yeah. that was really a fun, fun period. Uh, at around that time, it was kind of the end of the road for my little. Uh, uh, I'm writing a, a a book now, and my book is it's got two parts. It's kind of like so. Uh, uh, around that time, I ended up, uh, you know, making a big change in my life and uh so i remember that time period really well and, uh, well before we go on i know we're i don't want to take too much of your time here and we're getting towards uh the the question if, if viewers want to ask questions and like with most of our guests we had uh julian priester we had right. george colligan we had rams we had tracy and it's impossible to condense everyone's life down into like an hour interview and then there's a bunch right. of other questions i want to ask about playing and practicing right, because right. you know i've known you for over half of my life and out of all the musicians here in the northwest one of the things that i admire about you is you always have one foot going all the way back to the beginning of jazz and then you're always staying current about what's going on right now with jazz and i can't say the same about a lot of musicians here in the northwest and i'm not i'm not sliding anyone but i do notice that and admire that about you um so that's like i said this is a whole nother interview um but uh so Thank you. Practicing <laughs> is good. Yeah, practicing is good. I, I'm right. I'm right now. I'm. 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 You know, practicing. I, I'm not sure that it's always like evident to other others, but it it means something to me. Uh, I m move along and and uh, takes me sometimes a minute to get centered on what I'm doing and and to digest new information, but it's. Like George was saying, you know, it's just like a lot of it is like, you know, you get some, oh, yeah, that's a cool idea. Or this is, oh, I like this, this, the way this, these group of changes work together and things like that. And, and uh, we get phrases and things like that and put them in different keys. And, uh, uh, you know, for me now, I, it, one of the things I enjoy is repertoire. Like, that was fun to play that tune today. Uh, the... Uh, yeah, these are soulful days. That's a repertoire thing. I just you know, just well, that's that's what I would say is a, a couple questions before we open things up here. You're always transcribing stuff, and if people that uh, are friends with you on Facebook, they see that because you always not only will you do the work to transcribe the chart, but then you'll put it up for anybody to check it out and see and learn. You know, it's kind of kind of cool. I sometimes I'll do it in uh, with different people too because uh, it's it's fine to to get help. Uh, still, sometimes I'll get stuck on something, and sometimes I'll I'll, I'll know exactly what it is. But sometimes uh, uh, it, it's it's kind of a teamwork thing, and and that's what I like. Uh, there's certain uh, people that I do some of these these things together with, but that is a real uh, good one because that at some point. Uh, I got tired of 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 my limited uh, information, and and now I can you know play piano uh, good enough to play changes and things like that. Yeah. Uh, that that yeah that that's that's helpful because I remember I ha I I had to bail on a couple things. I remember some guy came through and. Every every change was like you know some kind of thirteenth chord with all kinds of things in it, and I went, oh, well, it's not that hard, really. If you see them over and over again, you understand what it is, 
But at the time, I was like, oh, yeah, 13th, what is that? One, two, three, four, I'm, I'm counting, you know. It was just unfamiliar. So. Well, um, I have a bunch of other questions. We'll have to do this again. We will, we will. Um, but at this time, do we have any questions from our viewers? It looks like we do. Hold one second here. Okay. Jay, can you talk to us about your experience in Japan? It's, but there are many experiences in Japan. You go every single year. You know, <coughs> excuse me. This I think I s s s inhaled a bug or something. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I uh, I got you know clean in uh, nineteen eighty four. And at that time, it was like, man, I got to be employed. So one of the things I did was like uh, uh, I beat my head up against the wall trying to get work. And then I realized, oh, man, OK, there's a thing you have to do. So I got a real professional demo tape and it had everything, top 40 and you name it, sent it all over. And one of the people that bit was this agent in Japan, and she knew, guess what? She knew a Tacoma guy, Jorgen Cruz. Jorgen Cruz just died recently, but he was a piano player from Tacoma, and he had some tax problems and a divorce and ended up going to Japan and never came back. So Jorgen is with the agent, and, and, and the agent goes, Jorgen, Jorgen, what do you, what do you, what do you, you know, this? And he goes, yeah, yeah, get him. So... So we went there, and we went there a few times working. And it took me a little while before I actually met, uh, got in, in with, with players. And I became real close friends with, I talked to them every day, you know, uh, close friends with a couple people there. Uh, and... That was really fun. We were working this thing called the Nagoya Castle Hotel. It was a big warlord castle, and we were, like, playing, you know, like, you know, commercial stuff. And Jeff Harper was on bass, and uh, J Josh Wolf, yeah. who died a few years ago, was a piano player. And we had, we had a great time, and... I met the the guys and 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 I was trying. It was like a, 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 a kind of a backhanded thing, because I was trying to buy a flute over there and this and that. And I got hooked up going to this music store to try these flutes out. And upstairs there was a tenor player. And at some point I decided to try and do a little music deal, sell something, and and make a trade for this flute. Well, the guy came down, the teacher upstairs, he had wall-to-wall -wall students, and he came down and he, he played. And I went, oh, yeah, okay, cool. And I saw him a couple of times, and, and since they, I couldn't speak Japanese, I had the little one-page thing, and he looks on it, and he goes, oh, I had done a recording with Cedar Walton. And he goes, oh, yeah, Cedar Walton, wow. Okay, so... I said to him, I'd like to play together. And he says, so he gives me, writes on a card, Star Eyes, Wednesday night. Yeah, okay, so I get done with my gig at the castle, and it's done at 9. So we walk, we get Jeff and Josh, and my son was over there at the time, Miles, and we went to this club. And I was just dying to play, and it was a great-sounding room. It's like, it's, it isn't always that way. I'm all warmed up, ready to go, and a great sounding room, and it, it, the bass player's just killing, and the whole thing, and, and I come in, and, and he runs up to the, the door as I come through, and he goes, yeah, you play now. And I go, oh, okay, and I'm listening, and I go, oh, uh, lover man. I, I've been knowing that since I was 13 or something, you know, so I went, you know, played that, and it was, I had a really good evening. So that's how I got hooked up, and we became friends, you know, laughing and, and carrying on. Uh, and he says, uh, would you like to play with my big band? Well, I didn't know he had a big band. This is like a small group. And I said, well, sure. 
And uh, <laughs> a few months later, I get a call. It's like the middle of the night, and it's, he goes, I am Kohama. Can you come to Japan? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's all uh, off. Next thing, I was on a, in, in a group of vans, and we were driving all over Japan and doing these gigs. And uh, it was really, really fun. I mean, and I was such an idiot. I didn't even bring a dictionary. I mean, God. It was like unbelievable. Right? Well, I think that's, you know, we've talked about this before and some of the other things, how, how music is a language like any other, you know, right. style of language. And particularly with jazz, with the composition, uh, the improvisational nature of it, you know, even if you don't speak the same cultural language, I mean, you can speak the cultural language of jazz and improvisation. For example, when you brought, uh, well, you did, I think it was last year, some of those guys, it was, I think, Kohama right. and Atsushi and oh, yeah. Yuki and Daisuke yeah, all came, yeah, yeah. and you were playing, I think, all over the Northwest, and you guys came to our gig at uh, uh, the Triple Door. Yeah, it was so fun. And you guys all came and sat in, and the cool thing about it was uh, th the conversation was was pretty good but when we came down to play i mean everybody could find out exactly what was going on and each one of those guys had a totally distinct unique way of playing i thought it was it was great to, to hear all of that together and work it was fun that that was a gr that was a great night we had we had a good time you were so gracious to have let everybody play and 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 also we had played earlier at the community college and uh oh uh god uh Cisco was there, and oh, that's right, Jim Cisco and uh, alto player uh, Rex Gregory, oh, and they God. came down too and played. That yeah, was a blast. Yeah. So it was really that kind of thing is really fun, and there was no, you know, problem. I mean, it was really a fun time. You know. Well, there's speaking of those gentlemen uh, when. We tried a couple of years ago line up a tour where you and I worked together in Japan, right, and it didn't right. work out. So I had reached out to Daisuke, and he got me in touch with a friend of his who was a mutual friend of yours, uh, Aichiro Toyama, E.T., E.T., wonderful e. drummer. E. Great. So what, what's your relationship with E.T.? Well, I played a few gigs with him. I mean, he's real, real famous. You know, now he's kind of a famous screw up a little bit but but uh, i mean we love you et we'll edit he, that he was he was the guy for a second he had i think he was working with uh tiramasu and hino and 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 some heavies and something happened and uh, so, I, but I think he's okay now. But. Well, we played the tour with him, and he sounded <laughs> great, and we had a really good time. So, anyways, we, we let's do. We have more more questions for Jay here. Okay, so the question is, uh, have you found the perfect trumpet mouthpiece? And you could probably throw a saxophone mouthpiece in there, too. And then the other part of the question is, how do you figure a C-flat, I'm thinking, is what the question is. Is that on trumpet or saxophone? I'm assuming we're talking trumpet here. Well, C-flat is just a, a B, so it's just a second valve. Uh, you know, I've been... I've been playing a couple of mouthpieces lately, and one guy uh, gave me this this really cool Giardinelli. I've been kind of stuck on these Giardinellis, but I'll get on a kick for a while. For a while, it was Bach. I like the sound of them, and and uh, but I I like these uh, Giardinelli mouthpieces. I've been doing kind of a a routine now with this COVID thing. I get up in the morning and I do this little blowing routine and, and as far as just blowing the trumpet it's, that that's going pretty good uh, the thing that, that not playing all the time is is that's a little disconcerting because uh, uh, there's nothing that is a substitute for for actual playing with musicians but uh, yeah no the mouthpieces for me I, I like the kind of I don't like a real super deep uh, uh, cup. Uh, if it's you know that those are, are hard to play for me and, and the endurance is weird. But I don't like them real s tiny either because I don't like the sound of them then. Uh, but but trumpet is is like it demands. It's like up it it demands 
at least for me, it demands a certain amount of upkeep, right? Just like watering your garden or whatever. I can't just just play it. I, I, I There was a one period in my life where I didn't have re any routines or anything like that. Well, I guess it was working okay, but uh, I think it's better to have uh, some kind of routine and things like that. Now, I'm pr spread pretty thin. I, I enjoy flute a lot, too. I should have played it today, but... Uh, so. We had a hell of a time with just one microphone and going from one instrument to the next. That would have been just crazy. But uh, maybe oh, next I time know. we'll have two mics know, set up. I know, I know. So, but, yeah, so, you know, trumpet is a, is a great instrument. But trumpet is one of those things where it can make you crazy because you can see people, you know, like somebody like Al Vizzuti or whatever, and they, they just pick up the horn and go, you know, like it just it seems so effortless. Uh, you know, there's a guy around here now too. It's very good that uh, 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 Porter. What, what's his name? Uh, Charlie Porter. He's got all kinds of chops. He's on online, and and I'll get sucked in. He will just go, yeah, this is how you do it, and I go, I don't know. It's really difficult to be thinking, and try to play. I think part of it, um, and we've talked a lot about setups and gear, and I, you know, I've kind of uh, taken your lead on a lot of this. I'm always trying different things out, and what my conclusion is, you know, we all have different teeth, different mouths, different makeups, physical makeups, and right. what works well for one person might be terrible for the next person. You just have to try things and see what works, you know, with a grain of salt, you know, with some guidance and instruction. And well, I was enjoying your sound today. My tenor sound was, seemed too spread for me. I was having a hard time getting any point on it, but I don't know. I just, you know. Well, on, on all of these weekly recordings that I've done, I've played different setups on every single one, and that's just, yeah. So for what it's worth for anybody out there, you you have to try equipment, talk to people like Jay. I mean, for me, Jay has been a huge resource of uh, just knowledge about gear and equipment, but you have to try things and, and uh, don't just play what your band teacher says because you've been playing for two years. You should be playing on a stiffer reed. You have to try things. You just have to experiment. Well, that's that. I think that really... Uh, when you do, when you experiment, you're gonna discover something, and and I think that, you know, in music, it's a lot of of it is is happens. It's not like just a little step at a time. There'll be a discovery. They'll they'll happen. You'll discover how to do something. Uh, not just with gear, but with learning how to improvise and play alone. Right, right. All that too. All of a sudden, you go, oh yeah, I see that. Oh that that that's working. Uh, uh, yeah, that you know, I was talking to uh, Sean Jones, the trumpet player. He's got unreal chops, and you think that like it's like lifting weights. He's getting stronger every day, and this and that. And he goes, he goes, no. He, he when he figured out how to play high, it was like he was doing it one day, and just went, started experimenting, and 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 he go, he said, I discovered it. I went, wow, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> so nice for you. Yeah. So, but uh, and he's very big and strong, yeah. and and people get so wacky. This is over at Port Townsend. Here's, here's Sean Jones, a huge guy. He's not fat, but he's he's big. He's way past six feet. I don't know six, or two or three or something, and big and strong. Got big lips and, and and just like he's playing like on a one and a half C mouthpiece. That, that, I would just die in that. I could take a, a shower in that. It's like so big, right? But for him, it's great. Well, there was a, this little student over there goes, yeah, maybe I should get a one and a half C. And his <laughs> shot tells like, no. <laughs> you know? do, do we have any other questions uh, for Jay at this time? Not at this time. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be doing this again next week. I'll be posting up information um, about the uh, tomorrow, actually, about the next concert and our next interview. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, Jay, we'll definitely have to do this again, both the concert and another interview, because we only, you know, just got to just a little tiny bit of the questions that I'd like to ask. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, anything yeah. you want to add before we close out here? 
Kareem, uh, you are an inspiration to everybody around here. I, I just, I, I, I love the fact that you're that you're putting it out like this, and and it's it's really, I've watched a couple of these, in interviews and everything. It's just really. Uh, it's such a great thing for our community. Thank you. I appreciate that. And as I've said before, uh, all of this is because of mentors and teachers and players like you, you know, I mean, because if, if I didn't have you guys as such a great role models, there would be no me right now. So we're, we're all the entire, I, I speak for everyone in the Northwest music community. Uh, thank, we're so thankful for you and the example that you continue to set day after day and all the videos and, and everything that you do. So thank you so much. And, and listeners, thank you for joining us. And, um, if you enjoy these concerts and the interviews, uh, please consider making a donation. It supports us being able to continue to do this. And, uh, all these things are free for the public to enjoy we do them every single week on facebook and then we put them up on youtube as well so you can watch them there for free so um and uh, if you have more questions for myself or jay feel free to leave them in the comments and we can um, get to them after the recording the broadcast is done thank you for joining us and we'll see you again soon have a good night yeah